What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. The sun rises and the sun sets, then hurries around to rise again. The wind blows south and then turns north. Around and around it goes, blowing in circles. Rivers run into the sea, but the sea is never full. Then the water returns again to the rivers and flows out again to the sea. Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. Everything is meaningless. Completely meaningless. So what's the purpose? Man, how time flies. How much time is left? Those are phrases that you and I see and hear and use frequently. Uh, without a doubt, this morning, time is every one of ours most, or one of our most precious commodities. By the way, every single one of us have the exact same amount of time. Mark, could you lift the house lights? Uh, every one of us have the exact same amount of time. All of us have 24 hours in a day. All of us have 1,440 minutes in a day. And whether you've done the math or not, all of us have 86,400 seconds every single day. Yet, quite frankly, all of us administrate that time differently. Uh, some people use time wisely, while others manage it inefficiently. Some, some enjoy the time they have, while other people live their lives in a miserable way. You look at them and, and they just look miserable. Some people have a lot of time ahead of them, yet for others, the clock is running out. Time affects every single one of us. Here are a couple, before we jump into our passage today in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, here are a couple of what I think are interesting facts about time. You know some of these, but time always moves forward. You say, okay, Brian, that's a no-brainer. I get that. Time always moves forward. Now, Hollywood has made time travel extremely attractive. Yesterday, I Googled, you know, time travel movies, and there are more than 50 movies that Hollywood has made about time travel. Uh, you know some of them. You probably watched some of them. Time Cop, Somewhere in Time, It's a Wonderful Life, Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, Back to the Future, and, and one of my favorite, Groundhog Day, where Bill Murray lives you know, the same event over and over again. Now, contrary to Hollywood, contrary to the internet, and by the way, if you're just bored this afternoon and you know, the dolphins aren't playing well and you're looking for something to do, Google time travel because you'll find testimonials of people who went back in time. But contrary to Hollywood, internet, and even some theoretical physicists, you can't go back in time. Time only moves forward. You can't press that retry button. You can't relive a bad day. You can't take back that mean-spirited text. You ever send a text message that was mean-spirited and you hit that send button and all of a sudden you realize, oh shoot, I wish I wouldn't have hit that button and I wish I could pull that back. You can't do that. You can't unspend an unwise purchase. Time only moves forward. Here's the second thing that I wrote about time. Everyone on the planet is somehow subject to the movement of time. Doesn't matter today if you woke up with, a with an alarm clock or whether you have a rooster in your backyard that crows and wakes you up every single morning. It doesn't matter if you mark time by a Rolex watch or if you mark time by the movement of the sun, everyone on our planet, no matter where they live, no matter what culture they come from, everyone on our planet is subject to time. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 5, God makes His sun to rise 
on both the evil and the good. All of us are subject to time. The the third thing that I wrote down is this. Although time is constant, it is perceived to move at different rates of speed. Why is it that sometimes time just seems to fly by and other times time seems to crawl by? You ever been in a classroom or maybe at work and you know you check your watch and and then you work or you sit in class what seems like an eternity and you finally look at your watch again and only five minutes have passed and you're like oh my word time is is crawling by and then there's other times when the days just seem to fly by by the way doesn't it seem that the older you get, time seems to go faster. Does anybody else feel that other than me? I mean, it seems like we just experienced Thanksgiving and we're about to hit Thanksgiving again. It seems like time is going faster. It's not. So we have now smartphones that has our calendar on it. I have that as well as you do. And I am convinced at times that I am controlling my schedule, even though actually I think it's Tiffany that controls my schedule, my administrative assistant. But, but uh, we think we control our schedule when we really don't. Our schedule and time controls us. That's, that's one of the truths that Solomon is bringing out in today's passage. So take your Bibles with me today and turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. While you're turning, we're, we're in the middle of a study that we're calling The Pursuit. And we're walking through the book of Ecclesiastes, one of, the, one of the ancient books of the Old Testament. And yet we're seeing that even though this book was written a long time ago, written by somebody in a completely different um, um, generation than ours, completely different world than the world in which you and I live, much of what Solomon experienced is relevant to us. And many people today, like Solomon, are pursuing, we're chasing after the wrong things. We come to church on Sunday and we pacify ourselves as if we're pursuing God. But in reality, during the week, there's other things that are more important to us. There's other things that we're pursuing. And we wonder at the end of the day why we cannot find happiness. Why there is no pot at the end of the rainbow. The idea very simply is that we're chasing after the wrong things. So as we walk through the book today, we're in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. You're familiar with these verses. Follow along. I'll read them out of the NLT and put them up on the screen. You follow along in the translation that you have. For everything there is a season, Solomon says, a time for every activity under heaven. There's a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to tear down, and a time to build up, a time to cry, and a time to laugh, a time to grieve, and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones, and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace, and a time to turn away or refrain from embracing, a time to search, and a time to quit searching, a time to to keep, and a time to throw away. By the way, somebody said that's a great verse for a garage sale, a yard sale. There's a time to keep things, and yes, there's a time to throw it away or sell it as well. I'm not sure if that's what Solomon had in mind. Verse 7, a time to tear, and a time to mend, a time to be quiet, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. Let's pray together. Lord, help us to realize today that everything is beautiful when it's done in your time. Father, help us to realize today that even though we think we're in control of our lives and and, and we try to put ourselves behind the steering wheel of our life, God, help us to understand that you're the one that's in control. You're the one that's manipulating the events. And God, I pray that you would help us to submit, to surrender to you and help us to allow you to control our lives instead of us trying to pull that that steering wheel away from you. 
So Lord, I pray you'd help us to learn from this passage. Help us to apply it. Give us something that we can put in our pockets and use tomorrow in our everyday lives. And Father, I pray that each and every one of us would realize that without Jesus, life is truly meaningless. Thank you for what you're going to teach us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Without a doubt, today's passage is probably the most well-known passage in the book of Ecclesiastes. If I asked you at the beginning of the study to name a passage of Scripture that you know in the book of Ecclesiastes, if you would have remembered, this is most likely the passage that, that you would have mentioned. Uh, this passage was made popular not even by preachers, but this passage was made popular by a singing group back in the 1960s. Anybody remember the birds back in, the, now see you're dating yourself when you raise your hand right there, all right? The birds back in 1965 wrote a song called Turn, Turn, Turn. And the words from that song came from Ecclesiastes chapter 3. As a matter of fact, if you hear the words of that song, it is almost 100% biblical. And I'm not sure what the, you know, what the relationship those guys had with the Lord, but when they sang that song, they were singing Scripture. Some have called Ecclesiastes chapter 3 a poetic masterpiece. Uh, th this chapter has been a source of comfort to many as it is read at funerals. If you've attended many funerals, I'm sure there's a time that, that someone stood up, a pastor or someone else stood up and, and read this passage of Scripture, reminding us of the brevity of life. And we sit back and uh, at times we allow the words of this, of this poem to to soothe our minds and to tranquil our hearts and to give us comfort in times when we need comforts. Yet, quite frankly, the purpose of this passage when Solomon wrote it was not to bring peace and comfort. Solomon didn't write these words to calm our troubled souls. Solomon wasn't in his bedchamber at night sitting back thinking, man, you know what? I'm going to write something that years from now people are going to be able to read at funeral services and it's going to make them feel better. That's not the reason why Solomon wrote this passage. The purpose of this chapter is to once again show that the chronology of our lives... The, the time of our lives is meaningless. Now, now, let me remind you, we've stated all along that the purpose of this book is very simple. Solomon is demonstrating that life without Jesus is meaningless. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter how many accomplishments you have achieved, how famous you are, how much pleasure you've been, you've been able to experience. All of those things are meaningless without Jesus. And the message that cries out from this book very simply is this, pursue Jesus. Pursue Jesus. If you're here today and you do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, be assured that our goal this morning is not to make a Baptist out of you. Our goal this morning is not necessarily to make you be a frequent church attender, even though we want you to attend church every single Sunday. Our goal for you is to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And one day when you stand before God, God's not going to say, okay, now, what church were you a member of? Oh, Hollywood Community Church. Brian, he's a pretty good guy, wasn't he? Uh, now, I hope God's going to say that part, but, but he's not going to ask you what church you were part of. What he's going to want to know is what you've done with Jesus Christ. And so the theme of the book, even though Jesus' name is not mentioned, the theme of the book very simply is this, life without Jesus is meaningless. Pursue Jesus. Now today I'd like us to see two truths that Solomon explains and then four practical applications. We're going to look at these truths. They're in the passage. We're going to study them. We're going to understand them. Then I want to unpack those two truths and I want to give you four practical applications, something that you can put in your pocket and later today or tomorrow you can pull out and these practical applications are going to help you and me with the life 
with the time that is still in front of us. So notice if you're following along in your outlines, the very first thing that I wrote is this. Time was created by God. Time was created by God. If you're familiar with science, it was Albert Einstein that said that time is an illusion. Time does not exist. Time is a, a, a figment of our imagination. One of the things that Albert Einstein said early in his career. Now, I certainly am not on the level, the intellectual level, to be able to debate with Albert Einstein. And I'm not even going to attempt to do that today. Yet Solomon here in the passage, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, states the opposite. Solomon states that time does exist because time was created by God. Notice how he says it. He says it so beautifully in the very first verse. For everything, there is a season, Solomon says. There is a, a time for every activity, every purpose under heaven. So Solomon is saying, no, there are seasons there are not only seasons, but there are times. There are specific chronological events in our life that are governed by time. Now, now I want to pause for a second and let's, let's learn something at the very least. Be reminded about something about God today. Because in each of these passages, these passages are not just about us, but at the end of the day, they're about God. So what, do, what does this passage teach us about God? The first thing that I want you to catch is this. God is timeless. God is timeless. That means that even though you and I are governed by time, God is not governed by time. We'll see in just a few moments that God lives outside of the boundaries of time. God is timeless. Here are two great verses. Psalm 90 and verse 4 says this, For you, the psalmist speaking to and about God, For you, God, a thousand years are as a passing day, as brief as a few night hours. Now for us, how long are a thousand years? They're a thousand years. For us, a thousand years are a long time. Yet the psalmist says that for God, a thousand years are just as one day, like the passing of one day. Peter makes the same statement in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8. Peter says, but you must not forget this one thing, dear friends, a day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. What's the idea? God is not subject to time. God is not governed by time. God is timeless. Let me, let me use two words. You're probably familiar with these words, but two words, two attributes of God that describe who God is and how God is. The first is this. God is transcendent. God is transcendent because God is transcendent. He lives outside of the space-time dimension. God doesn't live in our realm. God, God is not subject to the laws of gravity. gravity. God is not subject to the laws of thermodynamics. Neither is He subject to time. To God, a day is just like a thousand years. And a thousand years is just like a day. Time is irrelevant to God. God, God never ages. Did you think about that? Now, I mean, you look at me five years from now, you're probably going to look and say, my word, Brian, are you aging? You're, you're grayer than you were five years before. And man, you got wrinkled lines all over your face. Brian, you look older. And it's true. We all are aging. But God never ages. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Time does not affect Him. God is never rushed. Did you think about that? I'm kind of, uh, if you get to know me, I'm a little bit of a hyper person. 
And so I'm always running around all over the place. Even on Sunday mornings, it's hard for me to, you know, stay in one place. Vicky was up here practicing a little bit ago, about 10 to 9. I had to speak in the Spanish service. I said, okay, I'm heading to the Spanish service. I'll see you at church. And a few moments later, I'm just walking back here. And she looks at me and says, what are you doing? I said, I don't know. I'm just kind of walking around the building. I have this nervous energy. I'm rushed. I want to get started. Let's go. God's not that way. God's... God's not impatient. God is patient. God does everything, as Vicky sang, in his time. God never runs out of time. God what? He transcends time. He's outside of the realm of time. He's transcendent. The, the second verse or word that we would use to describe God is that God is sovereign. God is sovereign because God is sovereign. The past, present, and the future are all the same to Him. That's such a cool thought. He's sovereign. The past, present, and the future are all the same. Now, now what does that mean? That doesn't mean, you know, don't get in your mind, you know, Michael... G J. Fox, you know, who gets in the automobile and he hops back to the year 1885 and then he says, hey, you know what, I want to go back to 1500s and hops in his car and hops back to 1500s. Then he gets in his car and says, hey, I want to go to 2025 and hops up to 2025. Uh, that's not what it means where it says God is, is present in the past, the present, and the future. Here, here's what it means. It simply means that in God's eyes, the future is just as sure as the past or the present. In God's eyes, the future is already done. The future is already accomplished. Uh, how many of you are Frozen fans? You watch the movie Frozen. If you have little kids that you watch the movie Frozen, all right, what, what a popular... This past week, you might have saw it on television. They had, a, they had a TV show that talked about the making of the movie Frozen. You might have saw that. It was really interesting. If, if you didn't watch it, I'm sure you can find it on Hulu TV or something like that. But, but I mean, here's the idea. Um, uh, as, they, as they went through and illustrated how the movie was made, they talked about the creative process and the creative team, that they would take a, a storyboard and they would write out on the storyboard everything that they wanted to happen in the movie. And then from the storyboard, they gave that story to artists. And the artist would again begin to, to, uh, to draw those characters and to be able to draw out those scenes. And as they made the movie Frozen, they drew out those scenes scenes, scene by scene, and each of those scenes were called cells, C-E-L-S, and they made each of those cells, and they would make them out, and they would spread them out on a table, and in front of them was the entire movie, and the director at any point could place himself into any one of those cells, and he could move from this scene to that scene to any other scene. Well, in a very real sense, that's the way God has designed your life in mine. Uh, just as the directors and the creators of Frozen planned out everything ahead of time, the Bible tells us that God has planned out your life and my life ahead of time. Our lives are already written and God knows the outcome. The future is just as sure as the past. Let me give you a couple of verses. Psalm 139 and verse 16. Psalm 139, 16, the psalmist said, speaking to God, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Here's what David says, God, you are the great animator of my life. You are the great creator of my life. God, you have laid out the storyboard of my life before it ever happened. Isaiah 46 and verse 10. God says this, Only I can tell you the future before it ever happens. Everything I plan will come to pass. God says, for I do whatever I wish. So we talk about time. 
We illustrate the fact that God is transcendent. He's outside of time. He's, he's not subject to it. But we also see that God controls time. Why is that? Because God planned it. God orchestrated it. God diagrammed it. And God is the one who will bring it to pass. The, the second bullet point that I put in your notes is this. Time was created by God at creation. Time was created by God at creation. We see this clearly in Genesis chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. You know the story. Let me just read those verses. Then God said, there in that creative moment, God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. Then God did this. He separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And then he says this. Something that happened for the very first time. And the evening passed. And the morning came. Marking the very first day. Marking what? Marking time for the very first time. You see, it was God that created, that invented time. And just as God created it, so He will put an end to it. Revelation chapter 21 states that in heaven, there will be no more sun. There will be no more moon. There will be no night in heaven. Here's what will happen Time, the need for time will no longer exist. Now, think about that for just a second. How cool is that? No alarm clocks in heaven. None whatsoever. You can sleep as long as you want. All right? You're never late for anything. You don't age there. You don't die there. Death and sickness is no more. Why is that? Because time as we know it, in, in our dimension, time as we know it, there in heaven will cease to exist. So today we look at the timing of our lives. And it's important for us to realize that the time, our lives, the events of our lives come from God. That leads us to the second thing that Solomon is saying in here in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Not only was time created by God, but here's what Solomon is illustrating so beautifully in those verses. He's saying that life is controlled by God. Your life and my life, our lives are controlled by God. Now, now, I won't go back and read through all of these verses again. I would encourage you to go home and do that. But, but here's what Solomon says, if I can give just a synopsis. He says, there was a time that you were born. There will also be a time that you will die. He says, there are times that you plant a tree. And then there are times that you have to chop that tree down because it's grown old or it no longer produces fruits. There are times that soldiers are at war shooting each other. And there's a time when peace is declared and former enemies stand together in remembrance. There's a time to build a building. And there's a time that you tear down a building to make something new. Man, we've seen that in Hollywood recently. They're tearing down buildings and putting up buildings like crazy. There's a time to build and there's a time to tear down. There are times in which you cry and weep. And there are times to laugh. There are times when it's very appropriate to weep. And there are times that you just have to laugh. To cry at the wrong time is just as bad as laughing at the wrong time. There's times to weep and there's times to laugh. There are times to accumulate possessions. And there are times to simply give things away. Solomon walks through that passage. Now I wrote down a couple of notes. Here's what I wrote about that. First of all, your life and mine contain a mixture of blessings 
and burdens. Our lives contain a mixture of blessings and burdens. Like the synopsis found in this chapter, your life and mine are a mixture of these two things. Remember it was Job that said, the Lord, you know the verse, the Lord gives, and what does he say? And the Lord what? Takes away. As Vicky sang, blessed be the name of the Lord. Whatever God does, bless his holy name. As I contemplated this list, a, a, a few thoughts just came to my mind, and, and, and these are random thoughts. If they don't make sense to you, you know, humor me. They make sense to me, all right? Just a couple of random thoughts as I walk through this list. The first is this. As I read through it, I thought, I don't want to experience everything on that list. As you read it, you're probably thinking, you're probably sitting back thinking, man, there's some things that I, I want to experience on that list, but the, man, there's some things that I hope I don't have to experience on that list. As I read down it, I mean, it's almost like there's two different sides, and, and I like the first side a whole lot better than I like the second side, or I like the first statement a whole lot better than I like the second statement. For example, I love births. I love birth as a pastor. One of the things I love doing is, is going to the hospital and holding a brand new baby. I love that. We have, we have several couples in our church that are about to have babies, and, and I hope they call me. Lucas and Allison, call me. I think she's due this week. Call me if the baby comes, all right? I love births, but I'm not a big fan of deaths. I don't know where you are. I'm just not a fan of death. I, I like healing. Killing, not so much. I love love. And I love peace. But I don't need hatred. I don't need war in my life. Uh, the teacher is taking a look at life here. He's looking at an overview of life and, and saying that life in this world is pretty much going to have everything on this list. This list covers pretty much everything that happens from birth to death. If we had time this morning and and we started one by one and we allowed every person in the auditorium to give a brief testimony, a brief synopsis of your life. I'm sure that you would, you would articulate today that there were times of elation, there were times of extreme joy, there were times of extreme happiness. And yet there's also times of extreme sadness. There's also times of pain. There's times of mourning. There's times of grief. I don't want to experience everything on this list, and neither do you. But, but here's the second thing that I wrote down. The second thing is this. I don't get to choose the events and circumstances of my life. You don't get to choose the events and circumstances of your life. Every once in a while as a family, we, we play games and... and uh, kind of play cards. I never, I grew up in a really strict family. And so I, I grew up, we didn't even own a deck of cards in our household. We played uh, Rook and we played Phase 10, but we didn't own a deck of cards in our household. My mom and dad just thought that was, that was absolute sin. And so now that we've, uh, you know, liberalized just a little bit, we actually have a deck of cards. Now my mom would probably gasp if she saw this deck of cards in my hand today. But, but we have a deck of cards. And so one of the things that I've learned to play with the boys that I enjoy playing is I love playing Texas Hold'em. I'm not good, about, good at it. I don't play some, for money. So if you're sitting back, you know, and you're salivating, thinking, I think I can take Brian for a lot today. I never play for money, all right? But I enjoy playing, all right? I enjoy playing. And one of the things is I'm playing Texas Hold'em with the guys. And, you know, I, I have my cards and and. I'm playing well. Whenever I'm playing well, I'm thinking, I'm a pretty good card player here. And I start thinking, you know what? I wonder, you know, if somebody would give me $10,000, I would enter in the World Series of Poker. And I think I would do pretty good <laughs> because I'm playing pretty well right now. And yet then there's also times that I'm not playing well. And when I'm not playing well, for me, it's not my fault. It's the dealer's fault. Because they're what? They're just not giving me any good cards. 
Did you ever play that way? You get so frustrated. It's like, oh my word, four twos all over again. When are you going to deal me some good cards? The simple truth is this. When you're playing Texas Hold'em, you have to what? You have to play the hand that you're dealt. Listen, that's the way life is. Life is like that. Listen, we don't get to pick and choose what we want. We play the hand that we're dealt. At times, that involves unbelievable blessings and and moments of extreme joy. But at times, that involves moments of extreme pain. And it's almost like, God... When am I going to get a good hand? Lord, it seems like I continually to get I, I continue to get a bad hand. Listen, you and I play the hand that we're dealt. And God is the dealer of the hand. That's what Solomon is saying. You and I don't get to choose the circumstances of our life. The third thing that I wrote down, and and, and this was interesting to me, is these events seem to cancel each other out. If you notice, every on this list, there's a there's a good event, and then there's a seemingly bad response. Every single one, there's a positive, there's a negative. There's something we like, there's something that we don't like. There's birth and there's death. There's healing and there's killing. There's a time to accumulate. There's a time to give away. There's peace. There's war. And as I went through this, I realized that that these events in life seem to cancel everything out. That's what Solomon is saying in the passage. The teacher tells us that these times end up canceling each other out. That's why at the end, he asked the question, notice in verse 9, we read through verse 8 and we're going to look at 9 through 11 next week, but Solomon asks all of that. In the end, his, his conclusion isn't positive and he says, what do people really get for all of their hard? work. I know I've said this over and over again. I read that. It sounds just like a country western song to me. My oh my, you work so hard and what do you get? Pain and misery and problems and trials. God is in charge of our life. Now all of that would be extremely discouraging if it ended there. But it never ends there. Notice in verse 11, and we're going to look at this next week. Here's what Solomon says. Here's his conclusion. Yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. To God, the pain is just as beautiful as the pleasure. To God, death is just as joyous as birth. To God, grieving is just as important as dancing. If you and I had our choice, why we would always dance rather than grieve. And yet there's things that you only learn in the funeral home that you do not learn on the dance floor. There's things that God will teach you in that hospital room that He will not teach you at that Saturday night party. Both of them are a part of our life. And God takes pleasure in both. So much so that God says, everything is beautiful in God's time. When God allows it to happen, though we don't like it, though it hurts, though it causes pain, everything is beautiful in God's time. Two simple applications Solomon makes. Time is created by God. Life is controlled by God. Great theological truths. Now let me give you four applications. Four applications that make this make sense to us today. The first is this. Don't be surprised when troubles come. 
Don't be surprised when troubles come. We go through heartache in our life. We go through a broken relationship. We go through a lost job. The doctor looks at us and says, man, I'm sorry, I got some bad news for you. The boss looks at you. Instead of giving you a raise, he gives you a pink slip. And you sit back and say, what? What in the world is taking place? Listen, don't be surprised when bad things happen. Why? Because life is filled not only with blessings, but life is filled with burdens as well. Peter says it this way in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. Don't be surprised. Hey, let me just pause for a second. Uh, we've lived in, we've lived in a, a blessed bubble in the United States for several generations in which we can experience our faith and we can live out our faith without any fear of repercussions whatsoever. Let's not be surprised if that changes in the future. Because believers all around the world are suffering and persecuted for their faith. Why are we any different than them? Do not be surprised when troubles come your way. Life is filled with blessing and burdens. Here's the second thing I want you to see. Realize that you are not in control. God is. You are not in control of your life. God is. Now, as I mentioned, especially in our country, we are control freaks. I mean, uh, I mean maybe you're not. Maybe I am. Okay, let me just say it. Uh, uh, but, but I mean, we tend to want to control everything. We want to control the environment that our kids are in. We want to control where we work. We want to control our schedules. We want to control everything. We want to manipulate everything in our life. And if, it's, if we're not careful, we want to do that from a spiritual level as well. And we think that we can do a better job than God can. And so God, move over let me behind the steering wheel. I, I, I used to always hate that bumper sticker that said, God is my co-pilot. As if I was driving the plane and God was beside me just in case I made a mistake. Listen, friends, God doesn't want to be your co-pilot. God wants to be your pilot. And God wants to be behind the controls of your life. God is in control. You are not in control. Proverbs 19, 21. Here's what God says. You make the plans, but the Lord's purposes will prevail. Don't you think there's times that we make plans and God sits up in heaven and snickers and thinks, oh my word, if Brian only knew. Good grief, if Brian only knew. I make the plans, but it's God's purposes that pre prevail. I'm not in control of my life. God is in control of my life. Here's the third thing I wrote down. Recognize that God uses everything. God uses every situation to mold you into who He desires for you to be. You, you've heard me say frequently, one of the words that never come out of God's mouth is the word, oops, oops. You know, God's not looking at your life saying, oh my word, how did that happen? Uh, I didn't want that to happen in your life. God, God, I, I mean, at times we're almost like, come on God, what's going on? Are you in charge? God's never caught by surprise. God, God is never taken off guard. No, nothing ever happens that He didn't know was going to take place. God's in charge of everything and God uses everything for my good. Oh man, church, if we can grasp that principle, that is such an important principle of spiritual maturity. Whenever someone treats me the way I don't deserve to be treated, how do I respond? I sit back and respond. God's in charge. Uh, I trust God. Whenever I lose my job, God, you're in charge. And I know it's not easy. I'm not sitting back saying those are easy times. Come on, accept it. Suck it up. Trust God. I know how difficult that is. But when I realize that God is using everything in my life to mold me and shape me into who He wants me to be, 
Man, that's, that's such a significant point in my life. Paul says it this way in Romans 8, 28, but all things work together for good to them who love God and are called according to his purpose. What does the word all things mean? All, all things. Doesn't just mean the things I like. Doesn't mean the things that I would have chosen. No, it means God uses everything. He takes the good and the bad. He takes the pleasures and the pains. He takes the triumphs. He takes the trials. God has a way of, of molding everything together and using it for our good. Hey, listen, here. None of us like flour, but we all like cake. Nobody wants to just eat flour. Flour tastes terrible by itself. But man, you mix flour with sugar and chocolate, and boom, what do you got? You got a cake. And man, it's good. You can't have a cake without flour. And you cannot have godliness without pain. You cannot have holiness without trials and tribulations. I said at the beginning of our study that God's purpose for your life is not happiness. God's purpose for your life and mine is holiness. And God will do whatever it takes to push me towards the heads. And so whatever happens in my life, birth or death, healing or sickness, war or peace, love or hate, I realize that God's at work in my life. And it leads me to the last thing. Let me say it the way I have it in your notes. The last point is this. It is only when we trust God that life becomes meaningful. And all of a sudden, that picture that is blurry, when we, when we see things from God's perspective and we trust God that the fog begins to clear, the sun begins to shine. Light invades darkness and God is in control. That's what Solomon said in Proverbs chapter three, verses five and six. Trust in the Lord with all your hearts. Don't, don't lean to your own understanding, your own way of viewing things. In all of your ways, in all of your decisions, your circumstances, your relationships, in all of your ways, acknowledge Him and He will bring it to pass. You see, God makes everything beautiful in His time. Aren't you glad today that God's in control? I'm so glad today. I'm so glad today that somebody wiser than me is guiding my life. I'm so glad that somebody smarter than me is guiding my life. I trust God. I might not always like it, but I trust Him. For He makes no mistakes in His time.